This morning I am concluding a brief series of Lenten homilies on the temptations of Jesus Christ and our great temptations as well. Let us pray. We ask indeed, O God, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts might now be acceptable to thee, our God. Amen. We assume that the more spiritual we become, the less we should struggle with temptation. But Jesus was about as spiritual as they come, and the text makes it very clear that he was sorely tempted by the devil. When he was famished, the devil tempted him to miraculously remove the hunger that all humans were created to experience. Then the devil tempted him to be certain of the love of God rather than to believe it by faith. And now Jesus is tempted to let the devil help him fulfill Jesus' own mission. We know all of these temptations. They try to distort our relationship with God by making us doubt the words that were pronounced at our baptism. You are beloved. In this temptation, Jesus is taken to the top of a very high mountain where the devil and Jesus could see all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said, all this I'll give you, I'll give you, if you just fall down and worship me. Jesus responds to this temptation the way he does all three of them, which is by quoting scripture. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship and serve only the Lord your God. But notice what Jesus does not say. He does not say, kingdoms of the world? Ha! What do I want with the kingdoms of the world? Jesus yearned for the kingdoms of the world. The Son of God came to restore the kingdoms of the world back to God. That's why this is so tempting. The devil would not have tried to tempt Jesus by saying, let's forget this Messiah business. I have a little condo in Capri you can have. You can golf every day. That, that would not be tempting to a Messiah. No, the devil is trying to let Jesus know that the devil will help him with his own mission. That's why this is so tempting. I am constantly impressed by the high goals of the people who come to our seminary. You didn't make the sacrifices to be here to learn how to make a lot of money. No, you, you came here to join a community of faith and scholarship devoted to knowing the word of God in Christ, devoted to, to learning together what it means to serve the holy reign of Christ on earth. Those are your goals. So do you really think that late some night when you are knocking yourself out to prepare for another exam or to crank out another term paper that the devil's going to come to you and try to tempt you by saying let's forget all of this ministry and scholarship business. You should run numbers for the mob. <laughs> That's not going to be tempting to you. No, the devil does not try to take away our high purposes for life. What the devil will tell you is, 
you're going to have to be realistic about what this will take. He will insist that the ends will justify very wrong means. He will tell you that the world belongs to him and he knows what it takes to get what you want. He'll help you get what you want. He'll help your dreams come true. All you've got to do is make a deal with the devil. One of the special deals the devil is peddling these days is to tell you that you're on your own to make your goals come true. That God has done all that God's going to do in giving you the goal. That's quite a bit. Now it's up to you to fulfill your goals. The devil will say, that's just the way my world works. Well, that may be relevant advice if the world actually belonged to the devil. But it does not. The world still belongs to God, who is very involved even in the kingdoms of this world, in every life in this world, whether they realize it or not. So the devil is peddling operating instructions to souls that the devil does not own. Now you can tell when people have chosen to take this you're on your own to make it happen deal that the devil keeps trying to sell. And the way you can tell is that they inevitably become mean. They don't set out to be mean. They set out to be messianic. I'm going to make a difference with my life. And then in trying to make a difference, it's not long before they run up to resistance. This is true whether your mission is raising children or seeking social justice in the world. You're going to meet up with resistance. And upon that, it's then tempting to think, you will, should redouble your efforts. Or even to get to the point of saying, I will do whatever it takes to make the goal happen. And that's at the part where you have crossed the line into meanness. Trying to be the Messiah. The world does not need more mean messiahs from the church. The job of Messiah has been taken, by the way. Jesus does not say, I send you out to be my Messiahs. I send you out to be my witnesses, is what the commission is. Now ask any courtroom judge. The judge will tell you the last thing we want is for the witness to make things happen. The witness sees and the witness testifies to what the witness saw. This is not to say we don't have human agency in the work of Christ's coming kingdom on earth. Yes, of course we do. But it is to witness and to participate in what is always Christ's work. Sometimes we talk about the work of Christ as if he never came off the cross We say, look at what it costs Jesus to give you salvation. Now show your gratitude. Now it's up to you. But Jesus did not stay on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And he is continuing what can only be Christ's work of messianic salvation. The question is not what did Jesus do, but what is Jesus doing today? And how has he invited you to participate in it? This wonderful, gracious gift of a mission in your life, which is always not more than Christ's mission. Think about the things that you cherish the most in your life. Family, your close friends, the gifts that you've come to realize you have, a sense of emerging calling in your life, your health, the very breath in your lungs, which of these things did you earn? 
not one of them. All of them have come as blessings, and a blessing cannot be earned. But you can sure screw it up. And the best way to do that is to think you're responsible for it. Blessings can only be received. You shall worship and serve only the Lord your God. The reason we keep coming back here to worship day after day is to renew our vision of the work of Christ who calls and invites us to work worthy of our lives alongside him. After the devil left Jesus, we're told that the angels came to wait upon him. I don't really have time today to delve into a theology of angels. But let me conclude with just this one reminder that the word literally means messenger from God. There are so many ways that God can send messengers to care for you. Maybe it's an angelic being. I guess so, why not? But in my experience, more often the messenger from God is a sibling in Christ. Or a passage of scripture or a lecture in which your eyes are open to truth you've never encountered before, or a worship service that makes its way so deep into the most protected corners of your heart that you find yourself weeping in the pews. All ways in which God is trying to care for you. Jesus had just completed some very hard soul work, resisting the devil. And now it was time not for more work, not to develop another sermon to preach to the devil, but now it's time to be cared for. Time not for more achievements, but time to receive. And most of us, are much better at achieving than we are receiving. But the scriptures make clear that we can only live by grace. And again, you can only receive grace. So for the sake of your soul, Won't you pay attention to the angels who are trying to attend to you? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.